Good evening. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Tonight I'm going to be talking about journalism and memoir. I am a journalist. I've been a working journalist for just about all of my adult life. Too long now. And so, of course, I admire the work of other good journalists, assuming that I'm a good one. Uh, I'm also interested in memoir. Not that I'm likely to write my own memoirs, but I know a lot of people who do feel that they have a memoir or two in them and would like to write them. So I'm always, or at any rate frequently, talking with people who want to write memoirs and who are looking for good examples of it. So I thought that for tonight's show I would kill two birds with one stone and present a bit of writing by a man named A.J. Liebling. A.J. stands for Abbot Joseph, but nobody ever called him that. He was always Joe Liebling or A.J. Liebling. And he was a journalist who lived in the first half of the 20th century. And he was very much interested in sports. He was also very interested in all things French. And I'm going to read you a brief memoir that he wrote about his time in Paris when he was uh, a young student, like 22, 23 years old, studying in Paris and eating well and drinking well and getting to know the local girls. And this, I think, is one of the best examples of solid, lively memoir writing that I have ever encountered. It's a, a story called Passable. Following the publication of some of my other memoirs, I have received an avalanche of letters, perhaps a half a dozen, asking scornfully whether in my student days in Paris I did nothing but eat. I tried conscientiously to think of what I did between meals in the years 1926-27, when I was 22 to 23, and it seems to have been quite a lot. For one thing, in those days young men liked women. We did not fear emasculation. We'd never heard of it. This would today be considered a sub-literary approach, but there it was. Havelock Ellis was the sage who made authority in the dormitories. Freud had not yet seeped down to the undergraduate level. Molly Bloom was the pin-up girl of the Nouvelle Vague, and we all burned to, the, to beat out blazes boiling. Women offered so much fun from the beginning that further possibilities appeared worth investigating. For this, we considered acquaintance or even marriage with an undergraduate of the opposite sex insufficient. We assumed, perhaps over-optimistically, that the possibilities of the subject were limitless. They may not, that, they may not be, but no, inf no finite man will ever be, be able to brag that he has exhausted them. For the beginning student of all essential subjects, the Latin Quarter of Paris was an ideal school. The Restaurant des Beaux-Arts, as I have indicated, was a great place to learn to eat because the items on the menu were good but simple. The cafés on the Boulevard Saint-Michel offered self-instruction of another kind, but similarly within the grasp of the beginner. You could find any feature of be beauty or any feature of a beauty queen in our cafés, but they were all on different girls. A girl who was beautiful all over would pick a better neighborhood. So, just as at the restaurant, you had your choice of a modest but satisfying agenda. In doing that, you learned your own tastes. It was trickier than that because a woman, unlike a Navarin de Mouton, has a mind. A man may say, when he begins to recognize his tastes, legs on a woman are more important to me than eyes. But he has to think again when he must choose between a witty woman with good eyes and the dull one with trim legs. Give the witty woman a bad temper and the dull one constant good humor, and you add to the difficulty of the choice. To multiply the complexity, the woman, unlike the Navarin, reacts to you. She may be what you want, but you may not be what she wants. In such a case, she will turn out to be not what you wanted at all. The unimaginative monogamist has none of these perplexities, but I doubt that he has much fun either. 
I attribute the gloom of many young novelists to an adolescent mistake made at a church. Afterward, belated curiosity clashes with entrenched ignorance and produces that Timor Mundi, which is the mal de siècle ain't it awful, Mabel. Uh, the girls would arrive at their customary tables soon after lunch in late afternoon and establish themselves with a permanent consommation, something inexpensive and not tempting, for they would make it last until somebody treated them to something better. This might be a long time, and they had a skill in husbanding that drink that would have stood them in good stead if they had been airmen downed in the Sahara. When treated, they exhibited an another desert talent, the opportunism of the camel. They drank enough to last them to the next oasis. They spent the afternoon writing on the house stationery. If the waiter caught them doodling or doing tic-tac-toes, he would cut off their supply. With the hour of the aperitif came ad animation and hope. After the dinner hour, if they had not been invited to eat, there remained animation. It could always happen that if they kept up their spirits, some late customer would offer them a sandwich. The girls were like country artisans. They took money for their services, but only when they felt like working. On occasion, they would accept payment in kind, a dinner or a pair of stockings, but then, as often as not, they would ask you to lend them their current week's room rent. I suppose some of them had sweet men, but these must have been dilettanti too. No protector worthy of the name would have tolerated such irregularity. He would have said the girls of the Boulevard Saint-Michel were not serious, and he would have starved on a percentage of their earnings, like a literary agent who depended on poets. All the girls were young. It was easy to comprehend that this was a phase without a future, that there was no chance to accumulate. Where they went after they disappeared from the quarter, I don't know. They were brisk rather than chic, and they made up without exaggeration. My memory is not tenacious in matters of dress, but I'm sure the girls wore short skirts. I rem remember the legs. One girl helped me select a hat for a woman in America, and this would not have been possible except in a period when all hats were essentially alike. It was the age of the face sous cloche. The cloche was an enlarged skull cap jammed down on the head like an ice cream scoop on a ball of vanilla. For the rest, their clothes were not elaborate, with the short skirt and a short blouse and a short jacket, and underneath a soutien-gorge and pantalon. Having the point de repère once well in mind, one saw at a glance what was what. Sometimes a girl would enter en ménage with a student, usually a Romanian or an Asiatic. If it was one of the latter, with an allowance from home, the girl would disappear from her customary café for a while, or appear there only with him. If it was a Romanian, she would be on the job more regularly than before. Often a girl would make such an arrangement to gain the status of a kept woman, which would protect her from the jurisdiction of the police des mœurs. Once the cops of this unsavory group picked up a girl without visible means of support, they would force her to register. Then they would give her a card that subjected her to a set of rules. Once a girl has the card, she's bound to infract the rules, the girls said. We're all so lazy. She misses a couple of visits. She's subject to heavy penalties. Then comes blackmail. The police put her to work for chaps who give them, give them a cut. Oh, then no more chattering with student friends who have no money. It's the pavement for her and turn over the receipts to the mackerel at five o'clock in the morning. The police have opened another account. Well, I was glad to know that how th that was how things were. It made me feel like an insider, and it helped me understand cops who run to form everywhere. Our girls were not intellectuals. None was a geisha primed with poems. None were hetare who could have disputed on equal terms with Plato or even with Max Lerner but all served as advisors on courses of study. They knew the snap courses and the tough ones in all faculties, which prof professors were susceptible to apple polishing and which ones were the most resolutely vash. Above all, they had anticipated a theory 
that was to be imparted to me later as a great original discovery by T.S. Matthews, an editor of Time, who told me that the content of communication was unimportant. What did count, Matthews said, was somebody on one end of a wire shouting, my God, I'm alive, and someone on the other end shouting, my God, I'm alive too. It was a poor prescription for journalism, but a good program for conversation between the sexes. The girls did not keep us at the end of a wire. To one, I owe a debt the size of a small Latin American republic's in analyst fees saved and sorrows unsuffered during the next thirty-odd years. Her name was Angèle. She said, Tu n'es pas beau, mais tu es passable. You're not handsome, but you're passable. I do not remember the specific occasion on which Angèle gave me the good word, but it came during a critical year. I am lucky that she never said, Tu es merveilleux. That last is a line that a man should be old enough to evaluate. My brain reeled under the munificence of her compliment. If she had said I was handsome, I wouldn't have believed her. If she had called me loathsome, I wouldn't have liked it. Passable was what I hoped for. Passable is the best thing for a man to be. A handsome man is generally said by other men to be a fool. And in many cases, he must himself begin to believe that. The superstition that handsome men are dull is like the prejudice that gray horses quit. Both arose because their subjects were easy to follow with the eyes. The career of the late Elmer Davis, a handsome but intelligent man, was made more difficult by his good looks. Favored with a less prepossessing appearance, he would have won earlier acceptance. There are homely fools, too, and quitters of all colors. Women who are both randy and cautious, and therefore of the most profitable acquaintance, avoid handsome lovers because they are conspicuous. The man who is passable escapes attention. To be passable is like a decent suit. It gets you anywhere. Passable and possible are allied by free association. A young man wants desperately to be considered at least a possibility, but it's the only game in which there is no public forum and he can't present a testimonial from his last employer. He's like a new player in a baseball league where there are no published batting averages. To be passable gets him in the ballpark without arousing inflated expectations. The ugly man is the object of a special cult among women, but it's relatively small. He runs well only in limited areas, like a Mormon candidate in Utah. A heartening fact, if you are passable, is that there are more passable women than any other kind, and that a passable man establishes a better rapport with them. Very pretty girls are preferable, of course, but there are never enough to go around. Angèle was passable plus, a woman who looked pretty at her best and passable at her worst. Her legs, though well tapered, were a trifle short, and her round head a trifle large, for good proportion with her torso, in which there was no room for improvement. Her torso was solid renoir. Her neck was also a bit short and thick, a good point in a prize fighter, but not in a swan. She had a clear skin and a sweet breath, and she was well joined, the kind of girl you could rough up without fear of damage. Angèle had a snub nose, broad at the base, like a seckle pear tilted on its axis. It was a period when the snub nose enjoyed high popular esteem. The fashions of the day called for a gamine, and a gamine cannot have a classic profile. A retroussé nose, for example, looks better under a cloche. The cloche made a girl with an aquiline nose look like the familiar portraits of Savonarola in his hood. It gave her the profile of that bigot, or a spigot. I had an early belief that I could get along with any woman whose nose turned up. That, this, provided in later life to, this proved in later life to have been a mistake based on a brief series of coincidences, but when I saw Angèle, it still influenced me. Among snub-nosed idols in the United States, we had Mary Pickford, Marion Davies, May Murray, and Anne Pennington, to name a few I remember. The last two were dancers, and when they kicked, the tips of their noses and their toes were in a straight line. In France, they had a Madge Lottie and a girl named 
Lulu Egoboru. Here, memory, furtive and irrelevant, interpolates a vision of Le Egoboru taking a refrain of T for two in English in the Paris production of No No Nanette. Uh, we have no such artists today. Profession of, profession of ingenue exists no longer. There was a girl in Little Mary Sunshine who had the gist of it, but she will have no chance to develop. In her next job, she may have to play an agoraphobic lesbian in love with her claustrophobic brother. Anyway, Angèle had large eyes with sable pupils on a pale blue field and a wide mouth and a face wide at the cheekbones. Her hair was a black soup bob bowl, soup bowl bob as if she had put a cloche on and let a girlfriend cut around it. The corners of her mouth were almost always turned up because Angèle was of a steady, rough, good humor. Angèle was a Belgian. Half the girls in Paris were Belgians then, and all of them said their parents had been shot by the Germans in World War I. I met Angèle at Gypsy's Bar on the Rue Cujat, a late place outside the circle of tranquil cafés in which I usually killed my evenings. Most of the time I tried to live like a Frenchman, or rather like my idealized notion formed at home of how a Frenchman lived. The notion included moderation. I would drink only wine and its distillates, cognac, armagnac, and marc. I did not class French beer among alcoholic drinks. In the United States, I had been accustomed to drink needle beer, reinforced with alcohol. A six-ounce glass for 25 cents hit as hard as a shot of whiskey for half a dollar. I did not get drunk as long as I followed what I imagined was a French custom. I thought a sedentary binge effeminate. Now and then, though, I would suffer from a recurrent American urge to stand up and tie one on. It was the Trouvert's longing to hear the birds of his own province. Angèle impinged on my consciousness toward the end of one of these reveries. She said that I needed somebody to see me home. In Tours the previous summer, a girl making a similar offer had steered me into the hands of two incompetent muggers. Angèle was of a more honorable character. She came home with me. In the morning, when we had more opportunity to talk, we found that we were almost neighbors. She had a room in the Hôtel de, de Faculté, where the Rue Racine and Rue d'École de Médecine form a point they insert into the Boulevard Saint-Michel. My room, one of the pleasantest of my life, was on the fifth floor front of the Hôtel Saint-Pierre, next door to a Chinese restaurant that had dancing. At night, while I read, the music from the dancing would rise to my window and a part of my brain would supply the words to the tune as I tried to maintain interest in my book. It was an atmosphere not conducive to the serious study of medieval history, which was my avowed purpose in the quarter. Angèle not only lived by day on the same street, but frequented by night the same cafés that I did, the ta Taverne Soufflé, La Source, the Café d'Arcourt, all strung along the Boulevard Saint-Michel. She made her headquarters in the D'Arcourt, where it was the merest chance that she had not remarked on me, she said. She had so many friends, she explained, there was always someone engaging her attention. I said that in any case, I spent most of my time in the Soufflé, where the boss was a pal of my landlord. But after that, I would go to the D'Arcourt whenever I wanted to see her. It had a favorable effect on her standing if I bought her a drink there, and none on mine if I took her to the souffle. If she was not at her post, her waiter would take the message. He would also tell her to dress warmly in the winter and not get her feet wet, to take sufficient nourishment to keep up her strength, and not to be beguiled by clients who had, to his experienced eye, the aspect of muscle men recruiting for a brothel. It was a relationship already familiar to me from New York where a waiter was the nearest thing to a mother that a lot of these girls had. After that, I was with her often. 
I don't know if she had a heart of gold, but she had what I learned long years later to call a therapeutic personality. She made you feel good. When I took her out in the evening, we sometimes strayed from the quarter. This was like taking a Manhattan child to the Bronx Zoo. Girls did not shift about in Paris. Clientels were localized, and so were usages. Montparnasse, although not a long walk away from the quarter, had all the attributes of a foreign country, including, to a degree, the language. In Montparnasse, the types in the cafes spoke English, American, and German. The girls there had to be at least bilingual. In the quarter, the languages besides French were Vietnamese, Spanish, Czech, Polish, and Romanian. But the specimens of all these nationalities spoke French at least passably. The girls consequently could remain resolutely monolingual. The clients were students or simulated students at the university. Those were the days of the Little Entente, and France set the cultural and military pattern for the East European that is behind the curtain now. Romanian students came to French universities as freely as if they had done their secondary work in France. Aside from her concession that I was passable, which is wrapped around my ego like a bulletproof vest riveted with diamonds, I retain little that Angèle ever said to me. The one exception is a report so vivid that I sometimes confuse it with a visual memory. Angèle told me one morning that she and a number of her colleagues had been playing cards in her room. There were a couple of girls sitting on her bed, a couple more on the bureau, one on the only chair and another on her trunk, when one of them took off her shoes. A second girl said after a moment, it smells of feet in here. The shoeless girl said, say that once more and you'll say bonjour to the concierge. You get it, said Angèle? The concierge is on the ground floor, and we're on the sixth, so she'll throw her down the stairs. The other comrade, who commenced, said again, it smells of feet. So the other hooks on and drags her out, of, out on, onto the landing, and they roll down the stairs together, inter-scratching with all claws. On the fifth floor, two law students, interrupted in their studies, pulled them apart from each other. The girls couldn't work for three nights afterward. One student took up for the girl he had pulled upon, and the other took up for the adversary. Now the students have quarreled, and the girl whose feet smelled has moved in with one of them at the faculté, while the other student has moved in with the girl whose nose was delicate. It's romance in flower. Life in the quarter was a romance that smelled of feet. I'm afraid that I don't succeed in making Angèle's quality come clear. To attempt a full description of a woman on the basis of a few fragmentary memories is like trying to reconstruct a small, endearing animal from a few bits of bone. Even some, some of the bits are not much help. My arms try to remember her weight, I should say 118, give or take one or two pounds. It makes me wince now to recall that she used to butt me in the pit of the belly quite hard, and we both thought it quite chummy. My point of view has changed with the tone of my muscles. The proprietor of the house that I lived in was a Mr. Perez. And he's an old friend now. He retired from his management of the Hotel Saint-Pierre so shortly after World War II, but he continues to live in the quarter because he says it keeps him young. He has recently been made an officer of the Legion of Honor. He was a chevalier, a titre militaire, as I've said before, when I first came to live under his roof in 1926, having distinguished himself by courage in World War I. I always suspected him of trying to give the impression, however, that he had won the ribbon for the, oh, some discovery of in, in Aramaic intransitive verbs or the functioning of the gallbladder. That would have been more chic in his neighborhood. During World War II, he served as a captain of infantry at 51 and distinguished himself again. I was a bit put out, he said to me, when I congratulated him on his new rosette, because my promotion was slow in arriving. A man of 70 in the vicinity of the university who has only the ribbon has the air of a demi-failure. But the delay was occasioned by the nature of my business. The Chancellery of the Legion is cautious in awarding the higher grades to hotel keepers, 
because the hotel may be a, a maison de passe. Once I had announced my retirement, the rosette was not long on the way. Mr. Perez, in the 30 years at the St. Pierre, lodged an infinity of students. It makes him think of himself as a house master. One of our fellows, he said, is raising the question of confidence in the chamber today, he might say when you met him. He has gone farther than I would have predicted. Or he might say, one of our fellows is now the leading internist in Port-au-Prince. I had a card last week. Or one of our chaps, who is the professor of medieval history at the University of Jerusalem, has, it appears, achieved a remarkable monograph on secular law in the Latin kingdom of Acre. He, has, he had your room about ten years after you left. He at least worked from one time to another. The Ancien de l'Hôtel Saint-Pierre is the sole alumni association of which I would willingly accept a reunion. Unhappily, it doesn't exist. If it did, it would include the lady's auxiliary, bien entendu, the girl who lived with the Corian on the floor below me, the, the mistress of the Dane upstairs, Angèle, and subsequent and preceding Angèles of all promotions, and the two little maids from Dax, Lucienne and Antoine, who led the way to the bathroom, which was on the third floor when the client had ordered a bath. Then they allowed themselves to be trapped long enough for an invigorating tussle. Well, Monsieur Perez remembers Angèle almost as well as if she had made a name for herself as a comparative zoologist in Peru. She died in the winter of 1927-28, to 28, not of a broken heart, but of flu. I was no longer in Paris, but in Providence, Rhode Island, where I had returned for a job on the Providence Journal and Evening Bulletin. And Paris included a word of her death along with other neighborhood news in a letter that he sent me. Thirty years later, he said to me, she had a felicity of expression. Once she said to me, head of a ruin, how much do you extort for your cubicles? Oh, there wasn't a sou's worth of harm in her. What a pity that she had to die. How well she was built. She was passable, I said. I could see that Monsieur Perez was thinking me a trifle callous, but he did not know all that passable meant to me. So that is A.J. Liebling. That's the kind of writing he does. He's worth looking into if you can find him on the, in a bookstore or at the public library. He writes a lot about sports, about food, about travel, a little about American politics, although he doesn't allow himself to get too involved in that sort of stuff. But he is one of the greatest American writers of all time, I believe. A.J. Liebling, check him out. He's a wonderful writer. And that's all for tonight. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Thanks very much for listening.